we have we had the opportunity to get to know uh, maharaj over the last few months and whoever got in touch with him and got to know him we admire and respect him a lot we love him a lot for his sincere and faithful practice of the chanting of the holy name of lord along with his guidance to us in this path i would like to cordially invite uh, maharaja now to share his invaluable words with us thank you maharaj thank you prabhu i would just offer some prayers before i begin Om Ajnana Timarandasya Yananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Vacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hadvaita Gadadha Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so, as this uh, program today is held in honor of Lord Krishna's Janmashtami, I wanted to speak something about the significance of Lord Krishna's appearance in this world. As the name tells us, Janma, birth, and Astami, the eighth, Lord Krishna appears on the eighth day of the month, the particular month in which Lord Krishna appeared was the month of Bhadra, and it, it was an, at a very auspicious time. In the middle of the night, Lord Krishna appeared. The Janmastan of Lord Krishna is in Mathura. Mathura is one of the holy places well known in India. And one of the reasons why it's so well known is because Lord Krishna chose to appear there Mathura was, of course, a holy place for many years before because it was Shatrugna, the brother of Lord Ramachandra, who killed one demon there and established Mathura as the capital of that area. So that was in the Treta Yuga. Then in Dwapara Yuga, Lord Krishna appears in Mathura. So a long time between the two ages, Lord Krishna appeared approximately 5,000 years ago. And on the particular day, which we celebrate as Janmashtami, the eighth day of that, this month of Bhadra, a very auspicious time. Why does the Lord come in this world? That is described by Lord Krishna himself in the Bhagavad Gita, that he says, wherever there's a decline of religious principles and a predominance of irreligion, at that time I descend. In order to deliver the pious and annihilate the miscreants, as well as to reestablish the principles of religion, I come millennium after millennium. So the Lord appears regularly and the incarnation of Lord Krishna, which took, took place some 5,000 years ago, was a very special, very special appearance of Lord Krishna. Because he, he came not only to speak the Bhagavad Gita, which is very, very important. That's how the Lord reestablishes Dharma by speaking the message of the Bhagavad Gita 
as he did at Kurukshetra, that the Bhagavad Gita is spoken for the enlightenment of people in this dark age of Kali. Just after Lord Krishna appeared, Lord Krishna was on this planet for just over a hundred years. And then after Lord Krishna left this planet, he complete, concluded his pastimes in this world and disappeared from our vision. Then a short while later, the Kali Yuga began. And the Kali Yuga, which is the age we're living in now, is a very dark time. It's an age of irreligion. It's a time where there's a predominance of all kinds of sinful habits. And people are generally lazy, misguided, unlucky, and they have no peace of mind. And because of all these things, they live a short life. That's the nature of us Kali Yuga people. We don't live a long time. In some ways, it's an advantage for us. If we had to live a long time, it would be more painful for us. There's already so many troubles in our short life. We want to understand Lord Krishna's purpose in coming. I said one purpose was to speak the Bhagavad Gita for our enlightenment, to guide us. Because, as I said, people in Kali Yuga are unlucky and always disturbed in their mind. So to help us to control the mind, to give us some peace of mind and to give us the proper knowledge to understand something about the mission of human life, the Lord comes and speaks Bhagavad Gita for all of us, for our benefit, not just simply for Arjuna, but by speaking Speaking to Arjuna, he's speaking to all of us. So it's important to understand that Bhagavad Gita is there to guide us. And the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita is that we should surrender to Krishna. Lord Krishna, in the course of the 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, summarizes the different teachings of yoga, karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga. And he brings the conversation with Arjuna to a conclusion, telling Arjuna, give up all your religion. Sarva dharmam parayajnam mamikam sharanam braja. Where Krishna's concluding teaching to Arjuna is that he should give up all kinds of religion which are materially motivated. And he should simply surrender him himself to Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna promises, I will free you from all sinful reactions. I will protect you. Do not fear. So this was the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna was, and Arjuna surrendered. He did surrender himself. And because he surrendered himself to Krishna, so ultimately he came out successful. And as you all know, the Pandavas were victorious in the Kurukshetra war. So Lord Krishna achieved one purpose in coming, that he was able to speak the Bhagavad Gita. And that's immortalized for us within the pages of Mahabharata by Srila Vyasadeva, that we can all read or we can hear the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, however, is not meant for just only hearing, but it's a science. We should hear it, then we should apply. We should apply the teachings. Because Lord Krishna that doesn't only just come to reestablish the Dharma which has been lost, but he comes also to give pleasure to his devotees, as well as to annihilate miscreants. Now, the annihilation of the miscreants, that can be done by Krishna without him, him coming here. He can annihilate the miscreants through his Vasudev feature, through his expansion. He doesn't personally have to worry about killing demons, but he personally comes to give pleasure to his devotees. 
a devotee of Krishna wants to enjoy a relationship with Krishna. We want pleasure. Ultimately, we're all pleasure-seeking people. And Lord Krishna also likes pleasure. Lord Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. He enjoys very much being with his devotees. And the same way, we can also enjoy being with Krishna. We enjoy being with Krishna, not just simply for our own pleasure, but for the purpose of giving pleasure to Krishna. Krishna is the master, and we are all his servants. This is important for us to understand. Lord Krishna is known in Bhagavad Gita. When Krishna speaks, he's described Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. Lord Krishna is known as Bhagavan. He has all opulences. These opulences, things which we would all like to have, wealth, beauty, fame, knowledge, strength, renunciation. The renunciation we may not like so much, but the other things we're, we don't mind, we're very happy to have. Renunciation is also a very wonderful quality which Krishna possesses. Complete, he's complete. He has everything. Therefore, he is Bhagavan. And we are meant to be his servants. We have a relationship with him. Krishna consciousness is for cultivating this relationship with the Supreme Lord. Unfortunately, as I said, this is the Kali Yuga, and people are generally not very well educated about these kind of things. We don't like to think about God. We like to think about the economy. We think about peace. We think about the disasters and different diseases which are there in the world. We worry about all of these things. But we should actually understand there's a person behind this creation who is responsible for everything which takes place in this world. Creation means there is a creator. And the creator is not just only Lord Brahma, but Lord Brahma is working under the orders of his superior. And that superior is Lord Krishna. Lord Brahma is also a devotee. He is also a servant. Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, there he is also another servant. He likes to give service for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Who is, who is that Supreme Lord? There is one Supreme over everyone. Some may call him as Vishnu, and others may call him as Krishna or Govinda. We ourselves are following the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who appeared in Bengal some 500 years ago. And it was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who propagated the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. The, philosophy, the teachings were already there, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took them from the scriptures and he taught them to people and impressed upon them the importance of cultivating consciousness of Krishna. It was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who encouraged people to chant the holy name of Krishna. And he took scriptural evidence to, to give support to this. In the scriptures is stated that in the Kali Yuga, there's no other way, there is no other way there is no other way but by the chanting of the holy names. 
Therefore, while Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was manifest in this world, he remained in this world only for some 48 years. But the predominant part of his life was spent propagating the chanting of the holy name of Krishna and encouraging people to worship Krishna and to read the books about Krishna. Our Krishna consciousness movement is dedicated to fulfill it, taking up this mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We have established many centers around the world and Srila Prabhupada had personally come there to Geneva during Srila Prabhupada's preaching, which went on for some 10 years, the final 10 years of his life from 1966 to 77. Srila Prabhupada traveled the world several times and he did manage to visit Geneva. At that time, we had a more active center there in Geneva. And Srila Prabhupada did, did come there and spent several days there. And he met also with members from the United Nations and different other organizations. So Prabhupada understood the importance of the city Geneva, that so much so that he came there and spent several days of his valuable time presenting the Krishna conscious message to important people there. We are continuing to try to reestablish our Krishna consciousness mission there within the city of Geneva. We are holding weekly programs regularly inviting people to come together sometimes also other days during the week on different occasions and festival days or sometimes just simply in the summer going into the park devotees are having these kind of gatherings inviting people to come and get some spiritual nourishment we need to be nourished we need to awaken our spiritual consciousness. By nature, we are all Krishna conscious, but our consciousness has been covered by our conditioning to material life. That conditioning causes us to identify with the material body and we forget our spiritual nature. But the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is so powerful it will help all of us to revive our dormant consciousness of Krishna. So this chanting, of course, is generally seen around the world in different streets, different parts of the world. Devotees are there everywhere, chanting, dancing, often distributing literature. During this particular year, because of this year being very, very unique kind of year with the pandemic situation. Devotees are making use of technology to propagate Krishna consciousness, inviting people to take part in these Zoom conferences like we're doing here today. A number of temples, most of our temples are not really able to have public programs at this time with the situation, it's not favorable to have a lot of people come together. There is still a demand, there is still an interest. Generally, our temples will be packed on the day of Janmashtami. But with this situation, this very special year is very different from other years. So we're giving everyone the chance to associate using technology and people in their own home can watch and take part in the Krishna conscious program. This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. In previous ages, there were temple, there was temple worship. But in this Kali Yuga, the process is simply the chanting of the holy name. It's difficult for people to go to temples in this age. We can see, especially this year, very difficult. People don't want to go to a temple because 
so crowded, there's a danger of disease, people just safer to stay at home. But at the same time, they have a desire to get some spiritual nourishment. Therefore, we have to teach people, we have to make Krishna consciousness available to people everywhere. Indeed, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught that the chanting of the holy name would be heard in every town and village all over the world. It was stated by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Priti viti achiyat nagar adigram sarvatra pracharhoi be morana that the Lord's holy name would be heard in every town and village around the world. Now some people may think, oh, isn't Krishna an Indian God? Not really. Krishna is, God is not, first of all, God is not Indian. God belongs to the whole creation. He's the Lord of the entire universe, of everything. Everything comes from him. So it's not that there's simply an Indian God. Krishna is not just some Indian God. He's the God of the whole cosmic manifestation. Everything comes from him. And the Bhagavad Gita is not some Indian book. Although it's written originally in Sanskrit, Sanskrit was the original language of the planet. The English language, European languages, like in Switzerland, you have French and German, as well as English and Italian. It all comes from Sanskrit. Of, of course, not directly from Sanskrit, but often the Sanskrit from Sanskrit came to Greek and Roman, Latin, and then it came to Italian, what we have now, French, Italian, German, English, these languages, they all have their roots in the Sanskrit language. So the Vedas were all written in Sanskrit. Bhagavad Gita, Sanskrit. But it doesn't mean that it's just simply Indian. It's for the whole creation. In the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes the history of the Bhagavad Gita. He said, I spoke this knowledge to the sun god, Vivishwan. Vivishwan gave it to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu gave it to Ikshvaku. And in this way, the saintly kings understood it. So the knowledge was passed like this, from the sun god to Manu, father of man, all mankind, not just simply the father of Hindus or just simply the father of Indians, but the father of all, men, all, living in, all living entities. So Krishna consciousness is a universal science. It's for everyone. Krishna is in the heart of everyone. He's not just simply some Indian God. We could, I wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of God because we also understand, we think, well, there are many gods. There's the rain God, there's the sun God, there's the money God, goddess Lakshmi, right? Goddess of wealth, fortune. There's the goddess of learning, Saraswati. There's the god of wind, Vayu. There's so many gods. Agni, the god of fire, like this. So Krishna, is he, is he just another God? No, we should understand who is Krishna. Krishna is the supreme original personality of Godhead. Therefore, the founder Acharya of the Krishna consciousness movement, Srila Prabhupada, we refer to him affectionately, his full name is his Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, or simply Srila Prabhupada, he taught us that Krishna is not just simply another God, but he is the absolute truth. The absolute truth, the concept of absolute truth is more clear and much greater than just simply the concept of God. Because we can always say, well, there are many gods just another God. 
But no, he's not just another God. Krishna himself per personifies the absolute truth, that truth which is above everything. So Lord Krishna himself uh, is not just some God, but he is that personality over all the gods. He has dominion over everyone, every living entity. The material universes are divided up into three different levels. We have heaven, and then the earthly region where we are in the middle of the universe. And then there's the hellish regions below that. So on the heavenly planets, there are different devas or demigods, we would call them. And they're like, they're like ministers in a government. Just like in a government, you have a, you have a, a ministry, you have so many different ministries, different people all uh, working along under the direction of one personality, one prime minister. So Krishna is like that. He's like the supreme person over everyone. He's the original. We say the Bhagavan Swayam. Swayam Bhagavan. And this is mentioned also in Srimad Bhagavatam. Ete chamsa kalapumsa Krishna stu Bhagavan Swayam. That there are many different incarnations and different appearances of the Lord. But it is Lord Krishna who is the original form, the original personality of Godhead, who came into this world and his mission in coming was to reestablish Dharma, which he did by speaking Bhagavad Gita. He also relieved the earth of the burden of many Kshatriya kings. You may know from the, from the Vedas, from Shastra describes that before the appearance of Lord Krishna, Mother Bhumi, the personality of the earth planet, had approached Lord Brahma for help because she was feeling so much the burden of many different Kshatriya kings on her planet. At that time, Lord Brahma then went along with Mother Bhumi and other demigods like Lord Shiva, and they went to the shore of the milk ocean and they prayed to Lord Vishnu that, please, what should be done? And Lord Brahma got the message that you should all go and take birth on the earth planet in the Yadu dynasty, and I'm also going to come, and I will adjust the situation. So Lord Krishna came to relieve the earth of the burden of the different demonic Kshatriya kings, but his most important reason in coming into this world was to give pleasure to his devotees. That the Lord has his devotees. Those devotees are surrendered to him and they're fully engaged in his service. They don't know anything else but Krishna. They always want to sing his names and they always want to speak about his pastimes and his activities. And they dedicate everything, their body, their mind and words, all to the service of Krishna. This is the principle of bhakti yoga. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer and give away, do it for Krishna. Or Engage your mind in thinking of Krishna. Become Krishna's devotee. Offer worship to Krishna and bow down before Krishna. In this way, Krishna promises, we will surely be delivered from the material world, from this world of birth and death. Lord Krishna comes into this world to deliver us from this material existence because we're all caught in this wheel of birth and death. We take birth and although none of us want to die, we know that death is inevitable. As the saying goes, as sure as death. 
Death is sure, one way or another. We don't know coronavirus or what virus, or it may just simply be natural causes, but one way or another, we know we have to give up this body. But Bhagavad Gita teaches us that when we give up one body, we'll take another body because the body is only the dress of the real person. The real self is the soul within the body. The body changes from the child to the youth to the old age. The body is changing. The soul is the same. We're the same. We give up one body and then we take another body. So the body which we take is decided according to how we live and the consciousness which we cultivate in this lifetime. We have to be very careful, therefore, what we do in this life. It's very important. If we are conscious of Krishna, if we're able to think of Krishna, then in the next life, we can go to be with Krishna. We can go into Krishna's own abode. Lord Krishna has his own abode beyond this material realm. The material realm is the realm of birth and death. But in the Lord's abode, what is called Goloka, there's no birth and no death. There's no old age, there's no disease. There is only a life of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. Because in the Lord's abode, we don't have a material body. We, will, we develop a spiritual body, a spiritual form. Just as the Lord Krishna, when he comes into this world, Lord Krishna doesn't have a material body. People often do not understand the nature of Lord Krishna's birth and activities. But his birth is not like our birth. We take birth according to our karma, our past activities. And we take birth in a material body. Our soul is different from our body. But when Krishna comes into this world, he comes in a spiritual body. There's no difference between the soul of Krishna and the body of Krishna. It is all eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. So Krishna consciousness is cultivating this consciousness of Krishna as taught by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu, primarily by chanting the holy name, chanting the Maha Mantra. So, of course, on this day of Janmashtami, we do try to chant more, to do the chanting of the Maha Mantra, because it's the, the most effective, most powerful way by which we can awaken our God consciousness through the chanting of His holy name. Everyone likes to, to speak, we like to sing and dance. We have to learn to do these things in relation to Krishna, to speak about Krishna and to sing about Krishna, beautiful songs about Krishna. And we also enjoy dancing for the pleasure of Krishna. Everything can be done for Krishna's pleasure. And it's enjoyable also. It's not dry, it's not boring, it's very dynamic, very pleasurable. The more we do it, the more we feel pleasure. We take great happiness, great satisfaction in chanting and dancing and serving Krishna. Everyone's a servant. You serve the family, we serve the dog, we serve the country. We want people to develop consciousness to be the servant of God, Krishna. When Srila Prabhupada was beginning the society, somebody suggested to him that it would be better to give the society the name 
the International Society for God Consciousness. But Srila Prabhupada decided, no, it will be better to say Krishna Consciousness. Because I want, Prabhupada explained, I want everyone to know Krishna is God. If we just simply say God consciousness, then nobody will know. They will all have their own ideas who is God. But if we say Krishna consciousness, then it's very clear. Everyone can understand. Krishna means God, the all-attractive person. He has a, an eternal form of bliss and knowledge. He's not a person of this material world. He's a divine, he's the supreme divine personality of Godhead. 5,000 years ago, he came into this world to deliver God consciousness, to give us all a chance to awaken our consciousness of him. He performed wonderful pastimes, wonderful activities, just so that we could remember him. We can go and visit and see the places where he performed his pastimes. So we encourage all of you, take advantage of Krishna's teaching, read the Bhagavad Gita, chant his holy name. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak some words about Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for your excellent words and explaining to us about the history of Krishna's appearance and reasons for him to come, and also describing the relationship between us and Lord Krishna and what it should be. Thank you very much.